Hello. I hope you're all doing well today. Um, it's a lovely day in Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, where everybody should be. Um, life is good in Amherst. Um, and today we're going to be talking about monopoly and um, why is it that things are never where I want them to be? Um, okay, we're going to be talking about monopoly and marginal revenue and how businesses can make money um, and how business, business really functions in capitalist societies. I mean, you know, let's be real. Um, in other words. Okay, so starting with some dogs. Um, oh, these are student dogs. Oh, and a pig. And the student sent their pet is a J tree. Um, I had a J tree when I was in college. My mother gave me a J tree for my dorm room. Um, little spot of green. They were the very easy uh, house plants. Um, and then this poor pig. Oh, what people do to their animals. Um, let's see, what do I do to my animals? There's corduroy, um, you know, who's all covered with with uh, plant matter. Um, he had a good day. He had a visit from his best friend, Murphy. Um, and they ran around playing ball as they like to do. Okay, monopoly, capitalism's norm and its necessity. Without a monop without some form of monopoly power, businesses can almost never survive. And virtually every business has some form of monopoly power, and they all try to expand their monopoly power. Readings, stuff, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. If you don't know this skit, it is one of the two best Monty Python skits. Um, the other one being the famous parrot skit. If you don't know what that is, then go to YouTube. Stop listening to this lecture. You can come back to it. It's, uh, it's recorded. You, it's there. So go to Monty Python um, parrot skit in YouTube. And after that, go to the Monty, while you're there, go to the Monty Python Spanish Inquisition skit. These are, um, and after all, Monty Python's a bit of a, a monopoly. I mean, there are other comedians. There are other funny things. There are other ways to get entertainment. So it's not the only way to be entertained. It's not even the only way to laugh. It's not even the only British comedy, but it is the only Monty Python. You see what I'm saying is Monty Python has the, this, the guys in the Monty Python group have a monopoly over Monty Python comedy which is not the same as having a monopoly over all comedy or all entertainment, but it is a form of monopoly. You can't go out and claim your Monty Python um, without being sued. Um, you know, and you could go on, you know, it's like any business that has a name is a monopoly of that name. Any business that has a physical location or a location on the web is a monopoly of that location. Um, it doesn't mean you have a lot of monopoly power, meaning that if you raise your prices, you may, in the case of Monty Python, they could raise their prices for their, you know, um, their stuff up on whatever it is they sell these days. Um, they could raise their prices and they probably would not lose much business. If they lower their prices, they probably would gain some business, but not a a whole lot. The elasticity of demand is fairly low. Um, if uh, somebody, if Paula Poundstone, another hilarious comedian, if she raises her prices, and I think she's still touring, um, if she does, then um, she'll 
lose a pretty lot of business, maybe not sure, you know, um, some no name person who, you know, uh, you know, some comedian, I'm not going to name any names, but you know, some comedian who doesn't have that much of a brand name loyalty, whatever, raise their prices, they'll lose a lot of business. They have very little monopoly power. Paula Poundstone has some monopoly power. I think Monty Python has a pretty lot of monopoly power. Um, you know, Bruce Springsteen has enormous monopoly power. He can raise his prices, it's not going to make any difference at all in how many tickets are sold. He's going to sell out at any price. Um, he can lower his prices. He's not going to get any more sales. Um, so that's a lot of monopoly power. Um, you know, and then variations. The black sheep deli in Amherst has reasonable monopoly power. There are a lot of other places you can get lunch, though. If they raise the price on the sandwiches too much or raise the price on the coffee, then people will go elsewhere. Um, on the other hand, they can raise their prices some. And if they lower their prices, they'll get a little bit more business, not a ton more. You know, so they have a, they have a certain amount of monopoly power. Um, other places, other restaurants may have less monopoly power. They'll be more price sensitive. At the extreme, you may get something that really is pretty much completely anonymous. They may have a name on the door, but nobody cares, nobody knows. Uh, you know, Chinese restaurants on Mott Street in downtown um, Chinatown in, in New York. Um, you know, people don't know what it is. You know, it seems like a whole lot of noodle places. Um, so it's just one more noodle place. Um, and that's pretty close to anonymous. They raise their prices even a little bit. Everybody will just go next door. That's virtually no monopoly power but even that place will have some there'll be some people who this is where i go they'll stick to it even at higher prices and if you lower prices some it won't be a huge increase you know it won't be an infinite increase in so demand as in perfect competition because there'll be people who will stick to the other places so that's you know monopoly is a shading there's a continuum um yeah um okay natalie portman's a monopoly you know she's the only natalie portman um there will be people who will go to a natalie portman movie because she's in it um she can raise her fees to hollywood studios and they'll think about it do we want to pay that extra you know if she lowers her fees they'll be like well do we want to you know have her she's a little bit cheaper Taylor Swift probably has more monopoly power. She may, she's one of the very few people who can actually get away with charging for her music. Um, and she's pretty aggressive in fighting, um, you, know, uh, you know, people who download her music without paying, you know, pirate sites. Um, Adele is not, I understand. Um, you know, and then Daniel Craig, just because um, I noticed that I didn't have any men here, which, what can I say? It says something about who I like. Ah, there's Chris Hemsworth. Why is he worth $130 million while Natalie Portman is worth 90? Um, did Chris Hemsworth get more for Thor than Natalie Portman? Um, Bruce Springsteen, God, he was negotiating to sell his catalog um, for some outrageous amount of money. Um, how much money is Aaron Judge going to get when he goes free agent? Yeah, maybe you'll know by the time you see this. Oh, and here are a couple more people. Like I said, I generally like women. Um, corduroy's a monopolist. Oh my God. Even the look at that ridiculousness. And we still keep him. We didn't get rid of him, even though he does stupid stuff like rolling on his head. Um, uh, and even though we have to keep getting him more and more uh, rubber balls to play with. 
Um, okay, big ideas. Monopolists can raise prices above marginal cost by reducing output. This makes them rich at our expense. I mean, monopoly is not a great thing. But capitalist firms can only survive in some form of monopoly. Perfectly competitive firms can't survive. You know, so what can you say? Life's tough. <laughs> you know, we may like capitalism. We may like it as the best of the possibilities. You know, we may like some modified capitalism with a certain amount of antitrust regulations. You know, you, you, you have to decide this for yourself. You'll be dealing with these issues for your entire lives. Um, but uh, let's not have illusions. Perfect competition does not exist. Um, nor does perfect wisdom for politicians and for political processes. If you had any doubts about that, look at what happened in the 2016 election in the United States um, or what's going on these days. So um, monopoly survived by controlling location. You know, the black sheep has its location in downtown Amherst. Amherst Books is right there at, well, not at the corner, but close to the corner. Um, uh, Bank of America has a location in Amherst right at the corner of downtown. Um, talent. Bruce Springsteen has the E Street Band. He has his own talent. Um, the uh, Yankees have their talent. The Red Sox have their talent. Technologies. Microsoft has its technology. Apple has its technology. Reputation. Apple has a very valuable reputation. Um, and their economies to scale. You know, Google, you know, has its network economies, the advantages to dealing in Google stuff. Um, but also they are, they have such a large market that they can um, amortize any expenditure across a very large sales force and, um, and customer base. Okay. You know, game monopoly was invented in Western Massachusetts by a follower of Henry George, um, Elizabeth Phillips. If you don't know who Henry George was, I'm not gonna tell you now, Google him. Um, I will tell you, <laughs> he was um, a very smart Californian, self-taught economics, and wrote Progress and Poverty, which is one of the best-selling books in the 19th century America. Um, read for mayor of New York in 1886 against Theodore Roosevelt. I will not tell you who Theodore Roosevelt was. If you don't know, then go to Mount Rushmore. Um, uh, Roosevelt came in third. Um, the Democrats nominated an interesting guy, Abram Hewitt, who was a, um, a liberal capitalist. Uh, he was a, um, a steel uh, magnate, you know, um, owned a steel company. Um, he endowed um, a college in New York. Um, anyway, Abram Hewitt, uh, a Cooper Union. Um, and uh, Abram Hewitt was elected mayor kind of corruptly. Tammany Hall put him up to try to defeat uh, Henry George, who they really didn't want. Henry George was a reformer, a liberal, a progressive, populist. Um, and uh, his book, Progress and Poverty, is about how the monopolization of land will eventually um, lead all the wealth of society to be concentrated in the hands of landowners. So if that sounds familiar, it's because you read David Ricardo, who said much the same thing. And, and Henry George basically read Ricardo and translated that into American English um, and Californian uh, experience. Um, anyway, Elizabeth Phillips was a follower of Henry George, very impressed with his writings and developed a game, the landlord's game, that basically is all about how 
the monopolization of land will bring all the wealth in society to the hands of landowners. Um, and she based it in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, let's see, Grand Boulevard, Fifth Avenue, Madison Square, Pick, uh, Rickety Row, Begaman's Court, you know, Goat Alley, Wall Street. Well, it kind of sounds like, uh, yeah, she had some, at least some of these places are based in New York City. Coal mines, farmlands, timberlands, oil fields. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Anyway, Springfield, Mass. We have pictures from Springfield. Uh, Springfield Arsenal, sometime we should talk about it. It's, you know, the kind of, people talk about Lowell, Massachusetts being the home of the American, the American Industrial Revolution. No, no, it really was Springfield because Springfield had the Springfield Arsenal, one of the two national arsenals. The other one in um, uh, Harper's Ferry was taken over by... Um, John Brown um, and Harper's Ferry did not have the impact on the American industrial experience that Springfield did because Harper's Ferry did all the work in house. Springfield, they thought, oh, well, we'll contract out a lot of it. And then they realized, wait a second, if we're having the gun stock made one place and the gun barrel made someplace else and the flint made someplace else, these pieces have, these, everything has to fit together. And we don't want to be sitting here filing, which is what they would do. They take a file and they'd file until they could get the pieces together. Um, so instead, um, they made as a condition for getting the work that you had to make things to very exact specifications so that pieces could fit together. Interchangeable parts. That came out of Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, Springfield, Massachusetts is also one of the major um, industrial centers uh, through the, into the 20th century. In fact, Henry Ford wanted to um, put his uh, factory not in Springfield, but he wanted it in Holyoke instead of um, uh, Highland Park, Michigan. Um, he wanted to locate in Holyoke because it would be close to all the skilled workers and machine tool work that uh, came out of Springfield and up and down the Connecticut Valley from New Haven all the way up to Springfield, Massachusetts and up to Springfield, Vermont. Uh, we ran out of names, clearly. Um, uh, uh, but he couldn't get land in Holyoke because Holyoke was owned by a small group of people and they didn't want competition. They were running their textile mills and their paper mills and they didn't want anybody moving in and competing with them for workers. Um, and driving up wages. So they locked, basically they locked Henry Ford out. Um, and so he went back to Michigan um, and Detroit became the center of the American car industry and the world car industry, et cetera. Okay. Why was the Parker Brothers, which have you know, bought up the game, um, able to make a monopoly of monopoly? Because they had control over distribution network, artistic staff, and a legal staff to sue anybody, including Ford and his Phillips, um, you know, claim, you know um, for infringement of their copyright and their trademark. Um, they were able to make more money out of the game than Phillips ever could, and partly because they drove her out of business. <laughs> So she was right about monopoly. And the game itself is, is an example of monopoly power. Now, monopolies are smarter than perfect competitors. And you'd think Ms. Phillips would have known this since she was filled with monopoly. But no, no, no. What monopolists do is they think about the effect that producing more will have on prices. Um, and they know that and this is not always true. And companies are always trying to figure out ways to avoid this. But the basic rule is that if you lower your prices to attract more business, you're going to end up having to give a discount to everybody else who is willing to buy at the higher price. You're selling donuts at $1.50 a piece. And you think, okay, I want to sell more donuts. A lower price is for a dollar. And you know, all the people who are paying $1.50 turn around and say, wait a second, 
I'm not going to buy a donut at a fifty when you're charging a dollar to that person. Now, in practice, airlines, um, theaters, universities, they all do this. They all charge different prices to different people and get away with it um, because they restrict the resale of their tickets or their product. Um, I could buy a ticket on a flight to Chicago that may be $50 cheaper than the person who's going to be getting on the plane next to me. Um, but I can't sell my ticket to that person um, for a lower price than they're charging, than they're paying, and then go buy another ticket for myself. I can't buy two tickets and resell one. People do that, actually. Um, but it's a pretty risky business because you don't really know what other people, they, they keep all that information secret. Uh, the same thing for universities. Uh, virtually all of you are paying a different price for tuition, room and board, et cetera. Some of you may be, maybe there are some of you who are paying full fright, um, you know, the list price. Um, but a lot of you are paying something off of list price. Maybe you have an athletic scholarship. Maybe that scholarship is worth X amount. And somebody else has a merit scholarship that's X minus 50. And another one has a different scholarship that's X minus 75. Some of you have some combination of different types of loans. They package all this stuff in really complicated ways. Um, now, you can't sell your tuition to somebody else. So they can get away with charging different prices. Donuts, if they start charging different price, if they start charging a dollar for uh, for donuts and still expect somebody else to pay a dollar fifty, then I'll buy a dozen donuts and I'll stand out there and I'll resell them to everybody who is going to pay a dollar fifty. I'll charge a dollar ten. I paid a dollar for the donuts. I'll charge you a dollar ten. You're getting a forty cent cheap discount, and I'm still making some money. So that's not going to work. The donut shop is going to have to lower its price for everybody. Um, okay. Now, knowing this, the monopolists think, well, anytime we lower our prices to get more business, we're going to be losing some money on everybody else. So they think about their marginal revenue, not the price they're charging, but how much extra money do they get, taking account of what they're losing. Um, and then... Instead of pricing where the price equals marginal cost, they price where the marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Now, since the marginal revenue is always going to be lower than the price, that will mean they'll always be producing at a lower marginal cost than the standard perfect competition, which means less output. Monopolists will always produce less. There's your marginal revenue. It's always going to be less than the demand curve because the marginal revenue curve takes account that every time you lower prices to get more business, you're losing some revenue from everybody else. Um, now, perfect competition, and this is economists love perfect competition. And even places um, where I went to grad school, uh, some of my professors were um, famous for their work in imperfect competition. Uh, Michael Spence, who won the Nobel Prize, um, uh, Dorfman, I forget his first name, who did not win the Nobel Prize, but he really should have because his co-authors did. I always thought that was kind of odd. Uh, he wrote a book with Solo and Samuelson on imperfect competition. Um, you know, these people, but when they taught, they taught perfect competition. Yeah, they yeah they talked about monopoly and surplus, da da da. But it's a, it was basic. The basic model was perfect competition, which I thought was odd. But one thing about perfect competition is it's beautiful. Consumer surplus and producer surplus are maximized. The sum total surplus is maximized at the point where marginal utility equals marginal cost. And intuitively that makes sense because anything less than that output, you'll have a marginal utility above marginal cost. Anything beyond that level of output, you'll have marginal cost, that supply curve, 
above marginal utility. You don't want to produce that. But if you're producing where marginal utility is greater than marginal cost, then, hey, let's produce more because the benefits exceed the cost. So we should do it. So what you want is the point where marginal utility just equals marginal cost, which happens to be um, right here. Um, right here. Over here, marginal utility is greater than marginal cost. Here, marginal cost is greater than marginal utility. You don't want to be here and you don't want to be here. You want to be right here, and that's where you're going to be with um, uh, perfect competition. So it's beautiful. It's great. I mean, it has nothing to do with reality, of course. Perfect competitors are going to lose money because they ignore fixed costs. They can never cover their fixed cost. Well, yeah, sorry. They can cover their fixed costs only in a weird situation of rapidly rising marginal cost. Um, if marginal cost is going up really fast, then the perfect competitor may be able to cover fixed cost, but that's pretty unusual. The more normal situation, no, no. And the thing is they're not paying any attention to fixed costs. So it will be odd if they would cover them. That said, monopoly is messing with things. Monopoly is messing with things because, okay, here's perfect competition. You produce at this level. Monopoly, you produce where marginal revenue, which is less than marginal utility, remember, um, is there over here. And you produce at this point, selling at this point. You sell at the marginal utility for that quantity, for the monopoly quantity. Okay. Now, you're producing less. So all these units, all these sales that would have been good where marginal utility exceeds marginal cost, all these units are gone. You're not producing them and we're all worse off. We would love those donuts. I would love a donut. I love donuts. You know, aren't donuts like the best thing? You know, fresh. You get, sometimes you get this warm donut. Oh. Maybe it's time for dinner. <laughs> anyway, donuts are great. Making less donuts is bad. What's more, they charge higher prices because instead of charging at this price, you're charging at this price for the lower quantity. So you're transferring some of what was consumer surplus to the producer and you're losing, you're losing some producer surplus, but as a rule in economics, rectangles are bigger than triangles. So the producers are doing better, but the consumers are totally losing. They're losing the dead weight loss because stuff's not being made and they're losing the distribution. So consumers are really worse off with monopoly, but the business can survive um, because the business is now producing. Your average cost may be this and suddenly, Instead of producing where your demand, the, the marginal utility curve intersects marginal cost, um, where, you, well, in this example, you're making a teeny tiny profit. Um, but instead of that, you're making a good size profit because your marginal, your average cost, what well, you produce where marginal revenue is marginal cost, and your average cost is much less than the price you're charging. You're raising prices so you can actually make a good profit. Stock price goes up. The um, dividends go up. Um, your CEO's stock options are worth a lot more. It's great. Except for the consumers who are losing out in higher prices and less production. And also, you know, probably your workers because. Fewer comp competing businesses, workers are going to find it harder to leverage their position to get higher wages. Perfect competitors are losing on their last marginal sales. Notice, if you're producing this unit, if you're producing along here, are these prices and your marginal revenue over here? You're losing money on all those sales. 
you think you're making money because the price exceeds marginal cost, but you're actually losing money because your marginal revenue. To sell that extra stuff, you have to lower your prices so much that you're actually losing money. Everybody's worse off. But the business, the monopolistic business is able to make a profit. Whew, that's a lot of stuff. Um, what is that form? Um, that dog, I believe the lower dog over here, I believe that guy belongs to my former department chair, my friend, Michael Ash. Um, these dogs, not quite sure who they belong to. And I'm not quite sure what that form is. I knew one time. Okay. Okay. Um, again, lost output, dead weight burden, redistribution. Okay. Got that. Corduroy. <laughs> Thinks it's very silly. Oh, there he is. He's awake. Corduroy, hello, hello, hello. Hi. Don't worry. He's probably going to go back to sleep. Um, oh, that was gross. Okay. Um, let's see. Here was a toy. He was rolling on his back, and that's a plant. Actually, that, that picture was taken in this room because I recognized the plant. Oh, and the table. Yeah. Oh, and who's that? Those feet. Might be my wife, might be a daughter. Okay, Monopolis, the only seller. This includes companies, only sellers of products in their industry, like you know, Comcast, you know, local cable company. Um, but every company that puts its name on a product is a monopolist. Intel, Microsoft, Antonio's Pizza, the best pizza in Amherstown, Henian's Bakery, which is gone, uh, closed. All of these are monopoly in that particular product at that particular location. You know, you can claim to be pizza. There's a lot of pizza, but there's only one Antonio's. Ah, uh, monopolies and price discretion. That's so you're more likely to get hired when you get out of here. You're more likely to be hired by a monopolist than by a perfect competitor because monopolists have to hire people to help them figure out what price they're going to charge. You know, and oftentimes they may or may not be actually charging the best price. They may have misjudged the marginal revenue curve. They may have misjudged the marginal utility demand curve. Companies pay a lot of money for consultants and in-house people to figure these things out. A lot of it has to do with the elasticity of demand for the product, um, which again, as we talked about before, a little bit how much you need it. You need love. You may not realize it, but you do. You need love. Love, love me do. Always be true. But it's you don't necessarily need love from the same person. Um, how easily can you replace that person? Um, Buffy the vampire slayer had two men or two vampires in love with her. Angel who was good, and Spike, who was witty and evil. <laughs> That's my preference. Um, uh, you need food. Stop and Shop has very little monopoly power. Right around the corner from it in Amherst and Hadley is Big Y, right? Kind of right it down the half a mile, mile is Arby's, not Arby's, um, uh, another thing owned by um, Home Depot. And across the street from that is Trader Joe's and right you know, diagonal is Whole Foods and down Maple Street is this place run by these Turkish immigrants um, who are nice people, unlike the owners of all these other companies. Although Stop and Shop's unionized, so I Oh, and the Trader Joe's um, in Hadley has voted to form a union. Okay. Um, anyway, you need food, but there are a lot of places to get it. And you don't need to buy raw food. You could buy takeout. You could buy pizza from Antonio's. You could live on donuts. Um, Angel has little monopoly power because Buffy could go off with Spike and vice versa. 
Edward has less monopoly power over Bella when Jacob appears. So they're all assholes. Do you want your friends to have friends? Capitalists don't want you to have friends. They want you to stick with them. Yeah. You know, uh, Boeing doesn't want you to play footsie with Airbus. They want you to only buy Boeing planes and not like Airbus. Do you want your friends to be happy? But you want your friends to only be happy when they hang out with you. Don't know. Um, okay, let's talk about Google. I like Google. I like the people who founded Google. Um, uh, Google generally has good politics. Um, uh, um, whereas Facebook is or Meta, as they call themselves, is a disgusting, horrible company that embeds Nazis. Um, which would be bad enough in general, but for a company with all those Jews and top management is, is absolutely shameful. Uh, plus, um, uh, he was a real jerk at Harvard. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I don't like Meta. Um, I kind of like Microsoft. Um, I think Apple's overrated, but you know, uh, um, why do I like Microsoft? Um, just because it's what I use, so I have to like it. And why do I use it? Well, it's because it's what I've been using. And all my stuff is in Microsoft, and all my colleagues are in Microsoft, except those who switch to Google Docs, which increasingly I use anyway. But, um, uh, but when people send me pages, documents, whatever, from Apple, Apple World, I can't deal with that. Um, uh, anyway, Google Monopoly. Um, I've started using DuckDuckGo <laughs> for my searches. Um, I'm not sure yet how good that is compared to Google search. Um, of course, you could use Bing. They have really good pictures on their own page, but it's really not as good as Google. Um, I'll see how it compares to DuckDuckGo. Um, there are other ways to do searches. And of course you can, what the hell? You want to find somebody's phone number? You can go to a phone book if you can find a phone book. We do have a phone book around. Um, you could, there are other ways to find information. Um, you could go to the library and look it up in a diction, in an encyclopedia. I have a 1911 encyclopedia down in my basement. Um, uh, it's worth some significant, uh, you know, it's not a huge amount, but it's worth something. Um, uh, Google makes a lot of money by selling your information. They say, don't do evil. Well, Google sort of does evil. Okay, monopolists produce less, they charge more, they don't produce, uh, they don't. okay, you got that. Um, is monopoly good? Well, I was capitalist businesses will not be able to survive without monopoly, but it reduces social welfare, redistributes income from consumers to monopolists. Where would Taylor Swift be if she couldn't restrict access to her music? Where would Bruce be? You know, they would all be, you know, I mean, um, even if they have concerts, they have to be able to restrict access, which is something that, you know, makes it a monopoly. Monopoly restricts access. Perfect competitors have no restriction on access. They're just interchangeable with everybody else. Taylor Swift puts a name on her music and a name on her performances. Springsteen puts a name on his stuff. <laughs> you know, and they can charge more for that. And they can prevent people from having it. The key to monopoly is they carve out a section of the economy, and that's just them. And you can't have it without paying. Yeah, this is something for you to think about. 
you know, economics is not a science and it's kind of an ideology. Competition will not eliminate monopoly. Businesses will always, even if some competitor comes in and drives a near monopolist out the way um, Microsoft came in and uh, drove out, uh, God, who was it? Who was the uh, web engine before that? Oh, well, AOL. Um, and, uh, oh, and Microsoft came in with Microsoft Word and drove out Word Perfect which was a word processor before Microsoft Word. And Word Perfect had driven out, I forget who it was who I was using before that. Um, and Google came in and took a lot of Microsoft stuff. Um, and Apple keeps popping up, going back down, coming back up. You know? So, uh, you know, you have competition in the area of monopolies but they all end up being monopolies. Orthodox economists prefer to talk about perfect competition. They pretend it's the norm, but it's really unusual. You know, it's nicer. It's a better argument for capitalism. To defend capitalism by saying that, while well, recognizing that you have monopoly, you have to recognize that monopoly restricts output, keeps people from getting things that are good and allows capitalism to survive. Capitalism could not survive without monopoly, but monopoly has bad things about it. Now, it may be capitalism is still the best we can do, but it's not perfect and people need to recognize that. Now, if monopoly is ubiquitous, maybe we should just own up to it and see how we can limit abuses. The European Union has been working on that. Oh, this map's outdated. It shows the United Kingdom as part of the European Union. Not anymore. Anyway, the European Union aggressively has been attacking high tech, especially going after American companies. It kind of bums me out a little bit. It's like, you know, why don't you pick up some European companies for change? But they, they love going after Google. Um, and one result is that <coughs> Europeans pay a lot less for some things than we do. And we're gonna and we benefit sometimes. They're forcing standardization of um of power cords, um, you know, to the uh, USB C format. I'm not entirely sure what it all is about, but we'll benefit from that too. Oh. They're doing fast tracking the European um, Ukraine into the EU, but they're still keeping Turkey out. Okay. Orthodox economists try to wish monopoly away. It's not going to happen. Yeah. In fact, monopoly is a growing share of the US economy. Most industries have been experiencing increased monopolization, uh, been becoming more concentrated. Um, Fewer firms, um, you know, and markups have increased. You know, with increased monopoly power, they're able to charge higher prices. This is part of why we have increasing inequality in the United States. It's also part of why we've been having a burst of inflation lately, because companies have been driving up their markups very rapidly lately. I mean, you, you know, you can see that in this graph, although. Um, this is not up to date. That's from 2018. Um, source of monopoly power, economies to scale, make things, if, if production requires really large scale to be efficient, um, like uh, oil refining or semiconductor or airplane manufacture, you know, these huge factories needed, very expensive. You can only have a couple companies because only a couple factories. The world demand for these products is not big enough to support a whole lot of different companies. Network economies, Microsoft, me and Microsoft. Why do I use Microsoft? Network economies. Why do I use Google so much? Network economies. Um, it's really convenient if I'm working with other people, if we can work in within Google Docs. Um, 
printer and razor companies are really figured this out. Oh, we'll give you the printer for five bucks. And we're going to charge you $1,000 for every time you have to refill your um, ink cartridges. Oh, and the ink cartridges that come with the printer, oh, they're like 10 pages. <laughs> you know, Razor is another one. Um, obviously, Razor is not a big issue for me, um, but maybe for you guys. Uh, comp um, okay, location. <laughs> you know, you know, the parking lot next to Fenway Park. Oh, that was $45 in this picture, but this is a while ago. I'm sure it's more now. Um, you know, it's like you just, if you're going to go to the game and you don't want to take mass transits for whatever reason, um, you don't want to park at Alewife and take the train um do some walking whatever it is then okay just pay it and don't think about it because it's too painful to think about how much you're being ripped off the park um parking at airports the same thing information brand name you know i used to think that boeing planes were safe i'm not totally sure these days um and mostly I flew, ended up flying Boeing. I guess I've often flown Airbus, but they're really only two companies in the world. Um, and then apart from brand name, network, economies to scale, you just buy the competition. The big tech companies do this all the time. They're very big on this. And in fact, if you get, if you start, get involved with a startup, Kind of your basic goal is to get bought up by Meta or Google or one of them and cash out. Um, I my favorite nephew. Don't say I said that, but my favorite nephew. Um, has been involved in a bunch of startups. Uh, he finally is going to make it rich. Um, and then the tech boom crashed in two thousand and the value of his stock options went from millions of dollars down to zero. They didn't sell out fast enough. Um, and after a while he left. And since then, I think he's mostly been working at the, he was a chief technology officer at Yahoo or something like that. <clears throat> and now he's at someplace else. I mean, he's done fine, you know, but it's always, basically always been on salary. He's never, you know, never had one of those big payouts. Start out as a gamer. That's what he did. He doesn't do the tech anymore because he can't keep up with people who've grown up um, on, uh, you know, touch screens and the like. Um, he grew up on batch games. Okay. Uh, Exxon paid 74 billion for mobile. You think of it as Exxon Mobile, well, that's only like 20 years. Before that, there were separate companies, both coming out of Standard Oil, which was broken up by the federal government to promote competition. And then the federal government, which since Reagan has pretty much stopped doing antitrust, the federal government let them merge again. Nuance, um, voice recognition software, uh, Dragon, naturally speaking. Nuance provided the technology for Amazon's Alexa. Um, Amazon was getting nowhere. Um, then they just bought it all from Nuance, but they didn't buy Nuance, which they're very sorry about. Um, and Microsoft ended up buying it. Um, Microsoft has done a lot of these acquisitions, most of which haven't worked well. Facebook bought WhatsApp, um, not WhatApp, WhatsApp. And Google got a real bargain on Waze. I was using Waze for a while. Um, my uh, younger daughter's boyfriend was from a tech guy from Israel, and he told me about Waze, and oh, it was much better. But then it was bought up by Google. Now it's all in Google Maps, and who needs Waze? You know, I don't even know if it runs separately. Um, buy up the competition. Then you don't have competition. And then people will pay extra for these monopolists. Um, and ultimately, in some ways, well, you know, land, location, brand name, networks um, are all big. In some ways, the biggest thing is, is talent, because talent in some ways 
um, is not reproducible. Um, Shonda Rhimes, she's got a whole bunch of TV series and she is hot and I'm sure she's very rich. Taylor Swift, you know, um, maybe not my favorite music, but, um, you know, uh, you know, there are people with talent and they're very unusual. Um, why is it that uh, baseball players, a few elite players can make so much money or basketball or football? Oh my God, I mean, you know, um, <laughs> you know, the uh, my advisor in graduate school told me that uh, ninety percent of the variation is in the top one percent. The difference between somebody who's oh really, you know, out of this world, and normal smart people or talented people is huge. So you get a hold of those people and you can outcompete everybody else. You know, the people who started Google are that kind of people. And, you know, you're coming along, there's competition, other people will start doing things like them. And, um, you know, you get somebody who could throw a baseball at 100 miles an hour and, you know, a couple of years, uh, other people are throwing 101, 102. Um, you know, there's copies. People start copying Shonda Rhimes's um you know style um but it's that's maybe the most powerful source of monopoly certainly it's what we like to think of in the united states because why is it that americans are so much richer than everybody else uh we have a certain amount of monopoly power in this country we have companies with monopoly power um and it's ultimately based not on location, network, you know, the imperialist power of the United States military machine. All those things help, you know, and just, you know, brand name. Um, but ultimately, it's based on that companies like Microsoft, Apple, even Boeing have really talented people. And that's the ultimate source of monopoly. Okay, economy scale, location, brand name, managerial loyalty, you know, talent, better technology, political power. You know, all those things matter. I think maybe number five, which also goes into number four, because why do you care about having those managers, except if they're really good? You know, talent. These are monopolies. Um, Google's a monopoly. And then again, going back to this question, why do orthodox economists ignore monopoly to focus on something imaginary and illusory? And while you're at it, our first daughter was, our older daughter was named after Rosa Luxemburg. Honest. Okay. Monopolists raise prices above marginal cost by reducing output, redistribute income towards themselves, reduce social welfare, prevent some people from having stuff. Without monopoly pricing power, most firms would go out of business. And then they have ways to control. Okay, we'll stop the share. We'll say it was a pleasure, as always. There's very little I enjoy as much as professing. <laughs> and getting the chance to profess for you is real, real privilege. And I appreciate it. Bye bye.